Scientists at the National Centers for Disease Control in Atlanta today released the results of a study which shows that the lifestyle of some male homosexuals has triggered an epidemic of a rare form of cancer. Researchers know of 413 people who have contracted the condition in the past year. One third have died and none have been cured. It's a disease first detected in the gay community that has now spread beyond that. A disease experts are now calling a national epidemic. The virus can be transmitted from person to person, virtually a contagious form of cancer. And yet most of the country doesn't know about this cancer. Why? Well, I think it's because it's a gay cancer. At first, it seemed to strike only one segment of the population. This is no longer the case. Death didn't scare me. It was, it was uh, living with this for a long time. That's more frightening than, uh, than death. In 1981, I started to hear about the infections, the life-threatening conditions and the cancers which were occurring in gay men in the east coast of the States and in Los Angeles and San Francisco. This was the start of HIV, but we didn't know what its name was. We were hearing about it in 83. And then in 1985, there was a, an announcement, basically, on the news programs that a new disease has been found uh, which affects uh, gay men, intravenous drug users, and sex workers. Uh, and they basically said this new disease is, is killing people. Uh, we don't know anything about it. We don't know much about it certainly don't know how to cure it, and it's here. So that was a bit of a shock. London Gay Switchboard, I joined in 79, and uh, I was there when we started to get calls about this strange new gay disease from America. So I was around before HIV had a name, before it was even AIDS. I can remember some horrific headlines about 1985 you know, gay plague in London, gay plague increasing. And we didn't know what was causing it when it started. And, and there were lots of theories about poppers or about people who had damaged immune systems because they'd had so many other sexually transmitted infections, all kinds of rumours that were going around. So we were dealing with all of this on the phones. I know that by about 1985, we were getting, we were getting reports of you know, a number of cases, more cases. And we were getting deeply frustrated um, about what we could say and the um, reluctance in government generally uh, to being very specific about it. So many people felt that they could be at risk, even people who maybe had a a bit of an exciting life in their youth felt they could have been at risk. People that had travelled felt they could be at risk. Anybody who'd had medical treatment ab abroad felt that way. Um, so it was, it, from then on, it was sort of in our life and in the news all the time. I looked around amongst my patients and many of them were unwell. They'd been losing weight. I had patients with very low platelets, the clotting cells and they were having big bruises and bleeding. And I sent them up to specialists, and they said, oh, they've got this new condition. Now, we called it uh, GRIDS then, which was Gay-Related Immune Deficiency Syndrome. This means I need to talk about the fact that it was seen to be a gay disease. And uh, it took some months and some years into 82 and 83, 84, to realise that quite a lot of different communities were infected by whatever this agent was. I'd been sort of diagnosed in, say, October 82. All the hospitals had their own numbering system, 
and my number at the middle sex was L1. I was London 1 at the middle sex. So I was the first person diagnosed with HDLV3. You feel like you've got this killer virus coursing through your veins, that you're filthy, that you're a leper, that everybody is, nobody's going to want to, to know you or what have you. In 1987, to be diagnosed with HIV was the worst possible thing that could happen to you, really. Uh, I mean, di being diagnosed with cancer would be awful, but at least there was treatment and, to some extent, public sympathy. But with HIV, you were really not only ill, but an outcast. And, you know, I knew my life was never going to be the same again. I'm not, I had just turned 22. My partner was 19. We were born nine days apart in June 1964. He was one of the very few other working class gay men I knew. It seemed gay men were posh in, 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 in the 80s, and Bob and I, him from, Ed him from Edmonton, me from Stepney, were working class. We were almost like twins, really. We, we were just incredibly close. Bob died on April 15th. 1992. I expected to go the same way. It was, it was like, I imagine, that sort of people living in the First World War felt that sort of, you know, the soldiers were just cannon fodder and they were just dying in their sort of uh, thousands. And that's what was happening to gay men. I mean, people were just dying. There was, there was nothing. We wanted to do a ministerial broadcast. The whole committee agreed to it. But then uh, number 10 got in touch and said, you can't do that. The prime minister has to give her specific um, uh, agreement. And she didn't. My number one priority was to prevent it going further. It was the Don't Die of Ignorance campaign. A lot of money was put into it. I remember John Hurt did the, the voiceover, so very dramatic. And they were designed to shock, uh, which they did, <laughs> you know. Because I think normally with any sort of health problem in society, uh, the need to reassure people to some extent is taken into account, but with AIDS, that that was not the case. It was the whole point of the campaign was to frighten, shock, and that was it. Norman Fowler, who was the uh, the Minister of uh, of Health, uh, and he, I think, has been exceptional around sort of HIV and the kind of support that he's uh, he's given, you know, to HIV. Um, but he basically told Margaret Thatcher that HIV was in the heterosexual population in Edinburgh. The gays could die. They couldn't give a damn. You know, Africans, they could die. No problem. But the moment that it was in heterosexual population, it might affect them. This was a desperate position. I mean, you know, we had um, a health challenge. No one knew, frankly, vast amount about HIV at that time. There weren't any drugs. It was a death sentence. You had to warn people. It was on TV. I would say about four times a night, in that it would, it would be in with the advert uh, um, breaks, um, and also huge uh, uh, posters in the street. Uh, so it was, it was very, very evident. You, know, you, you saw it everywhere. 
There is now a danger that has become a threat to us all. It is a deadly disease and there is no known cure, but it's spreading. So protect yourself and read this leaflet when it arrives. If you ignore AIDS, it could be the death of you. So don't die of ignorance. We had a lot of um, reaction um, from the public. We had a lot of people who said they knew best and uh, what we should do was isolate people with HIV. That uh, people with HIV brought it on themselves wasn't our job to do very much about it, if anything. Oh, it was horrendous. I mean, it was horrible. And it was such a horrid advertisement. I mean, I know that, the, but it was all built on fear. It's a, it's a, it's a double-edged sword, isn't it? That on the one hand, you might be wanting people to have a, uh, a sense of what's going on and maybe some warnings, but it kind of demonizes those people that have the virus. And, you know, that's one of the problems. That's one of the legacies of that is there's this terrible sort of stigma. The campaign happened, and for us the big deal was not those big television adverts that everybody remembers, but the fact that the campaign also put a leaflet through the door of every household in the country. I will never forget the little old lady who phoned me because she was terrified that her cat might get AIDS if it bit a gay man. You know, and people who phoned up who were paranoid that they might have touched a doorknob that had previously been touched by a gay man and what if he'd been masturbating just before he touched the doorknob? Could they have got semen in? Because, you know, they bite their nails and, and it was like, oh, for God's sake. I think that was part of the psychology of the campaigns. Um, not only scare people, but leave them in no doubt that this was going to make make you a social pariah. You know, you were not going to get sympathy. You were going to have to be dealt with as a person who was dying, but you weren't going to get public sympathy. For those who say it created stigma, people come up to me still at meetings and say I'm very grateful uh, for the information that you gave. It saved my life, etc. So. You know, I'm sorry if it did cause uh, stigma. I didn't see it in that way. I didn't see why it should have caused uh, stigma. But what it did do, I think, is it told the maximum number of people. And the interesting thing was that when we did our follow-ups, it showed that over 90%, 93% uh, of the country thought we were right. Uh, to do a campaign of this kind. The UK government actually acted a lot faster than some others. There was a massive drop in all sexually transmitted infections on the spot. People didn't know anything, and I think probably a scare campaign was reasonable at that point, but I think it also freaked out quite a lot of young gay men who were just developing their sexuality. There is a huge amount of, of stigma and fear and you know, a lot of misunderstanding, which still goes back to all the kind of misinformation that was being dished by, by sort of, you know, papers and, and what have you. People aren't out about their status. They're beginning to. It's, it's beginning to. There is, a, there is a movement. The gay men with HIV have been the trailblazers in uh, changing culture uh, for those with HIV because many of the people with uh, HIV have been gay and living with their condition for 20, 30 years. They're not feeling so much stigma. And this is a, a beacon for those who are feeling shamed or stigmatised, whether they be African or IV drug users, and say, well, look, if that man can get up on television and say he's got HIV, I can do it myself. The government doesn't have a lot of money for big campaigns and things like that but also they're putting HIV on a back burner um, and a lot of that is is people who just want to shove it under a carpet uh, and they haven't learned the very basic lesson which a number of governments have learned to their cost across the world that HIV is only special in that if you ignore it it gets bigger. A great sadness was of course we did this massive campaign uh, but it was never followed up. Public health just gets to the back of the queue 
um, all the time, in spite of everything that learned committees say, you know, about it's the number one priority. It isn't the number one priority. No one even believes it's the number one priority. And when it gets cut, if it can be cut back, then people will uh, cut it back. We we do it on a uh, we do it on a shoestring, and we could uh, prevent not just the HIV, but we could prevent things in in other areas as well with a bit more uh, imagination and a bit more oomph than we have at the moment. It's difficult now, you know, looking back 30 years on, to realise quite how scary those times were. You know, we went to funerals week in, week out. We can't lose sight of, of what it was like in those, in, in those years. You know, roughly 82 to 94, they were the most horrible of times and we did lose a generation.